Venezuela and Canada playing to a 1-1 draw and then uh, Canada winning in penalties. The goal from Canada from Jacob Schaffelberg, who replaced the injured Tejan Buchanan. That came in the first half. The goal from Venezuela in the second half from Salomon Rondon. All right, for more on this one, let's welcome in a former member of the Venezuelan national team, our Alejandro Moreno. Ale, your thoughts on uh, this game and what went wrong for Venezuela as they go out here in the quarterfinals? Well, I hope everybody watching this game had a whole lot of fun. I imagine that for the neutral, it would have been a lot of fun. This back and forth, no balance, game is stretched, no structure, and yeah, a lot of fun for the neutral. But that game that was a lot of fun for the neutral was not the game that Venezuela needed to play in order to beat Canada today. And we mentioned this in FC earlier today. We said, look, Venezuela cannot get in a back and forth with Canada. And what did they do? Oh, they got in a back and forth with Canada. And so that exposes your center backs. And the center back position is something that I've been saying all along during this competition. It worries me about Venezuela. It worries me. Me preocupa. It worries me. And sure enough, today they were exposed time and time again. But it's not just about the center backs. There's a lack of structure through the midfield as well. There's a lack of control. And I think this goes deeper than just in today's game against Canada. It's about the moment. And when you haven't had a history of success, which Venezuela hasn't had, Venezuela is, is sort of beginning to get, to get success. We talked about it in yesterday's show that it's only been over the last 30 years that there has been this, this growth in Venezuelan football. Well, 30 years is not enough history when you compare it to, say, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, so on and so forth. We haven't had as a country a history of success. And so when you get to this sort of moments, when you get this whole stadium behind you, when you know the magnitude of the situation, the magnitude of the moment, then you, you get anxious. You, everything speeds up. And the game for Venezuela sped up from the very beginning. And there was never a moment in which Venezuela actually put the ball down and let's play, baby. Let's knock the ball around. Let's show some patience, some composure, some calmness, some intelligence in reading the game. It wasn't because Venezuela all of a sudden started playing the second half that they tied the game up. It's by, by an inconceivable mistake by Canada and Maxine Crepeau. They tied 1-1. It could have gone either way. Venezuela had some chances, but Canada had chances. They had chances in the first half. They had chances in the second half as well. The game was stretched, was out of control, was fun for everybody, not fun for me, <laughs> not, for, not fun, I imagine, for Jesse Marsh or Fernando Batista. Regardless, Canada then go on to win it on penalties and... Let me just say, and I, I know I'm getting a little long here with my participation, but I'll just say this. This is particularly hurtful because today is Independence Day in Venezuela. So that hurts. And two, this is the same way that we were bounced out of Copa America 2011 in penalty kicks in a game in which we could have and should have done better. So it stirs some memories. So all I will say to you, Seb, is be very careful with your narrative in this conversation. <laughs> I, I'm a little ledgy. I'm a little prickly right now. Just thread carefully, that's yeah. all. Ale, you can have the ball as much as you want here on Football Americas. We're never gonna, we're never gonna fight you over it. And I know Ale had a shot, I believe it, was it off the crossbar in extra time of that semifinal, Ale, is that right? There's that poke, oh, I, Ale. I, I, did, I, did I say thread carefully? <laughs> did I, did I, did I There's say? There's the poke. <laughs> Did I say control the narrative? <laughs> yes, not only was off the crossbar and down to the line and out. But the good thing is that I've turned the page. It's only been 13 years. I've yeah. turned the page. Yeah. I've let it go. There it is. Uh, what did you make of Canada tonight? Like Alice said, they had so many chances. This felt like a game they would, where they would not advance and, and look back on all the missed opportunities. Yeah, uh, Sebi Salazar, the cacti rancher over here. Dang. Uh, <laughs> we, we said this in FC, uh, talking about... Fernando Batista, the head coach of Venezuela, and how smartly he made adjustments in the first few games. All three games, actually. The first game versus Ecuador, inserting Bello and Yonder, and how that changed the game. The second game, um, I believe the third game was with Mexico, right? Yes. Sec yeah, second game was Mexico. Yes. That was the one they won. Correct. Sec second game versus Mexico, how he inserted Cáceres Jr. into that midfield. And, and it gave them an overload in that midfield, and they were brilliantly just outclassing the Mexican national team because of that overload in the midfield. He tried that again today. But Jesse Marsh, instead of having Kone in there, mm -hmm. who's much more of a ball winner, who's much more north and south, he put in Jonathan Osorio in there to help out. A little more possession, refined, refinement with the ball. Uh, and between Jonathan David and Osorio and Estacchio, Jonathan David coming down, 
and, and helping out with the six or whoever was in that sixth position, it gave them the extra number they needed in that midfield to overpower and then skip that line because never in this game did the Venezuelan midfield appear. That's why Ali's saying they never could spray the ball, they never could hold the ball. That's because they were skipping that part of the field. They were making this a very north and south type of game. North and south on the end lines. North and south through Jacob Schaffelberg. North and south through Alfonso Davies when he did appear in the ball. North and south through Jonathan David and Kyle Laren. I can't count how many times Canada in the first half got behind the Venezuelan national team, which was alarming because it wasn't something that Venezuela had shown throughout this tournament, but they exposed them in that. And as they exposed them, I got the feeling with the amount of opportunities that Canada was wasting that something was bound to happen. And yes, Bombito and Crepeau had an error off their own corner kick, by the way, which Salomon Rondon beautifully finishes off. It's not an easy finish. It's a very difficult finish. He does it well. And now they're behind the eight ball, and now you're giving Venezuela more opportunities at goal. Even though Canada had the majority of the opportunities in front of goal, if you don't finish those plays off, this will happen. I thought the 1-1 was a fair result, and I really was struggling to see which way it was going to go. Penalty kicks was just pick your poison on who was worse. If, and I say this as honestly as I can. Spain versus Germany today. Mm -hmm. Portugal versus France today. And the best football match of the day was Canada versus Venezuela. And then we get that in penalty kicks. But I was thoroughly entertained. Yeah. Canada today, I don't, I don't, Casey. I don't, I don't know about the best. It might have had, best, it it might was, have had some action. It was the best game. Entertainment, entertainment nonstop. <laughs> what did you make of Canada in this game? Because if, if I think about the Canadian performances through the tournament, we gave them the most praise after the loss to Argentina. And right. then in the next two games, where they Flat. win yep. but have a man advantage for most yep. of those games, they, they really you know, didn't look that good and certainly not an attack. And then today with Tejan Buchanan out, and obviously Schaffelberg came, comes in and has a great game, but they seemed like a totally different team, didn't they? They did, but also... Aside from the finishing, which was true, uh, clearly true. an issue. But, but some of it also has to come down to the tactics of, of Venezuela because if I've ever watched Canada play, what do I not want to let them do? Get in behind me. So let's play a high line from opening kickoff and let them get in behind us over and over and over again. Okay, it could have been away from you before you even had a chance to get back into the game off of the air that you just forementioned. But I don't understand how if you've, if you've watched them play, keep them in front of you, make them beat you with some sort of skill. So at times went missing. But then get into a track meet, exactly what Ollie said they couldn't do, and they, they played right in the hands of Canada. And Canada did everything they could in that match to keep Venezuela in this game and give Venezuela an it opportunity really <laughs> to win this game, and including being terrible on penalty kicks as well. So it, it really was, to me, Jesse Mars is going to go back, look at this game, and go, sometimes it's just better to be lucky than good. What about that goal? For Venezuela, like who's who's at fault there between the Canadian goalie and the defender? It's tough because you're in a you know a race, just a foot race, and Rondon is so strong, and he just bumps um, Bombito Bombito off the ball, and you have to at least affect the player or the ball. Mm. And Bombito, I think, just got bumped, and then it seemed like he just took a step back off of Rondon and gave him a little bit of space. I don't know if he's not to be that far off his line? Yeah, and he can see him because he's running back towards his goal. But I don't know why Maxime was so hesitant. I think that's a Jesse Marsh like tactic, was, that press. Because that's their own possibly. corner kick. It yeah, I think throwing, I think. It was a throwing off a throwing. Oh, was right? it a throwing? Yes. Yeah. But as soon as that ball got played, that mm -hmm. long ball got played, he needs to get on his bike and get back in, in, into the goal as quickly, as quickly as possible. Because that exactly in that moment could happen. And I think it was definitely a miscommunication. It was a definitely mistimed, and um, I think Bombito needs to be so much stronger. Is that a is that a goalie mistake there, Casey, or is that something that the goalie is being told to do by his manager? You think? Could be both. I mean, because in some ways, a manager can tell you what to do, but you still have to be strong enough with experience to say, okay, the positioning in this situation is mm -hmm. where I need to be. I'm not just going to go out of position because somebody told me to go out of position. I need to figure out and read the game how the game needs to be read. And, and you have to be pessimistic as a goalkeeper. You have to always be thinking, what happens if he gives the ball up here? I can't get chipped over my head when I've got a 1-0 win in a Copa America quarterfinal. i got to be in a, a spot where I, I, it gives me the opportunity to make the save. And so we, we've talked about it with Matt Turner at times. 
that a coach can tell you, I want you to play this 40-yard ball over two defenders, drop it in on his left foot, and then under pressure say, you know what, I'm keeping the clean sheet. Wham! Smack it up the field. When it's right to try to play that ball, I will. And I think Crepo got caught in a really horrible position. Yes, the defender should have done much better for him. No question about it. Um, but you as the goalkeeper have to put yourself in a spot that best helps your team. And that was not the spot. Ali, we've now seen Canada in competitive play four times here under Jesse Marsh. What's your big takeaway from what they're doing and, and how they're advancing in this tournament? Uh, hmm. I'm going to try to be positive about Canada. Again, become a positivity that I am. Um, look, I, I think it's a team that can hurt you if you get involved in the track meet in the back and forth. We just mentioned that because I think they have players that can hurt you running in behind, but they have difficulties finishing chances. There, there is no doubt about that and against an opposition that is better organized than what Venezuela was today, they're going to have difficulties creating those same opportunities. Uh, the way that they press the ball, Canada, uh, I think in some ways could work against lesser opposition, but even today, Venezuela, once they figure out that they were not going to get possession through the midfield, they put in a second striker in Cadiz, they bypassed all of that, and now they're just lumping the ball off to uh, Salomon Rondon and Cadiz and trying to win second balls, and they created all sorts of issues for Canada. And so, there are good aspects to what Canada does, but I don't know that those things that they do very well are sustainable against the top level opposition. They will be sustainable against lesser teams. Today, it was highlighted because Venezuela, for reasons that I cannot understand and I cannot get beyond, I can't get my head around, they decided, you know what? Let's run with Alfonso Davies. Why not? Let's give it the full stride with Jacob Schaffelberg. That'll be fun for everybody. Um, Again, if, you've, if you're Canada and you play against a team that has a little bit more know-how in terms of how to read the game, how to process information on the run, and how to be able to digest that information, and then put some calmness and patience in the way you play the game with confidence through possession in the midfield, then I think Canada is going to have fine difficulties. Because I don't think, on their own, I don't think they create enough, and I don't think that they defend well enough to keep better teams at zero. Even today, as poor as Venezuela may have been at times, Venezuela had their opportunities as well. So, I don't know. Was that positive? Sort of? Kind of? Maybe? <laughs> I don't really care. Yes. For, for a guy whose team just lost in penalties to Canada, I was about to think about as pretty positive a response as we could uh, eh. hope. There it is. There it is. Uh, Ali, what do you make of this, of this Canadian team? Where do you see their strengths? And do you see any weaknesses that might, as Ali says, come back to bite them against a team like Argentina, who they're going to face next? Yeah, I think they do try to, you know, have good quality chances on those transitional moments. But then again, it's when you get into the final third and you do create those chances that they have to be put on target. You can see that they were whiffing some balls. Mm -hmm. They just weren't finding the player in the box with that final pass um, and picking players out. It was just kind of hopeful balls. And then um, you could see Larea hitting that one with the outside of his That's foot. That's right, and yeah. Luckily, it kind of got into Kyle Larry's You think it was a pass path. or a shot? I think it was a pass. Uh, sorry, a, a complete shot. Okay. with the outside of his yeah. foot. And then Kyle Lahren was just on the end of it. So I think if they can be better in the final third and then also a little bit more organized defensively, then moving on into the semifinals, they will find a little bit more success than they had tonight. Um, and, and I saw most times when they were defending, it looked like everybody was kind of 1v1, left alone. And they were kind of just, just I don't know. They were somewhat like Swiss cheese. There were a lot of holes in and around the back line. And I think if they can tidy that up and then be better on those transitional moments, which, you know, they had some disruptions against Venezuela and I thought they played well the, finding those, you know, skip passes um, it, where, you know, they can beat lines and then face up to go in the final third and then tidy up, you know, those chances and then hopefully they can, you know, create more. What about the big names, Herc? I mean, Alfonso Davies, we say, is the, the best player in CONCACAF. You often say, Jonathan David, best nine in CONCACAF. What did you see from them tonight? I'll start with uh, Fonzie Davies. Not enough, right? And Alejandro, Casey, myself, you, you, Vaz, Ali, we've asked, why doesn't he play higher up on the field? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you see him, the ball gets caught underneath him. 
technically he's not as clean. He's a player that needs everything in front of him, and he's a game changer when everything is in front of him. But in an advanced position, those spaces maybe aren't there because I thought about it for a second. Well, Schaufelberg's looking a little tired. There's no Tejon Buchanan. Why not throw Alfonso Davies in there? When he gets into that final third, at least here, right now, with, with the Canadian national team, and I'm not talking about what he sees or does in Bayern Munich when he's got a lot of quality around him, but when he has to be forced to be the man, he has struggled. It's not been his game, but hey, he buried a penalty kick when he needed. After the last time we saw him hit a penalty kick, it was a World Cup, right? Against Belgium, and he missed that one. So he seems to be growing in that leadership position. Hopefully he can uh, be a better player against Argentina because his team's going to need him. As far as Jonathan David, I see a player today that did everything for his team, but he looked like he was running on fumes. Mm. He really looked tired, but mm -hmm. he's such a skilled player in that nine position, but you don't need to be the skilled player in the nine position right now. You need to be the guy who finishes off opportunities like you did in the last game that brought you here against Chile. Or excuse, um, was it Chile? I believe it was Chile. Um, you need to be that yes. player. You need to be brutal. that player, yeah. yes, that brought you here. Uh, you need to be the goal scorer. But when it comes to this Canadian national team, when we look at what makes them so difficult to play against them, they're so athletic. They're so vertical, they're so fast, they're so direct and in your face. But they lack that finishing quality. And we saw it in the first game against Argentina in the first half. They had two chances, two chances, concrete golden chances against Argentina defending World Cup champions in the first half of the opening game. And if you put those away, that's a different game because goals well, change games. But we also know in that first half if Messi was Correct. the Messi, he Correct. would have had but a hat had, trick. And it would they have, have their yeah. chances. And you put those yeah. away, you could put a team like Argentina mm -hmm. in a precarious position like Ecuador did. You give yourself an opportunity. But if you can't, and the team knows you can't, <laughs> they take their chances, yeah. and they know that you can put you away because they give up a ton of chances. I think the center back position for this team, Bombito especially, I know there are a lot of rapid fans, MLS fans out there, and they've spoken unbelievably great things. It is the next player that's going to go to Europe, Canadian fans as well. This tournament has been subpar from them. That's a position of worry. If I was, if I was Jesse Marsh, I would want to shore up that back line. Big picture, though, Casey. Yep. Uh, Jesse Marsh, who we know interviewed for the U.S. soccer job, has Canada... Right. Uh, in the semifinals of this tournament. How much credit does he deserve sure. for what he's done, and not just with his team, but in yeah. very short order? That's what I mean, I'm saying. He took yeah, over it was very quick. less than a month, about yeah. a month before. Got a, got a rude yeah. awakening in the opening game against the Netherlands and yeah. kind of gave it a reality check and said, wait a minute, maybe we can't mm -hmm. be that cavalier against a decent team. Cleaned it up in the next match and then you know, kind of came into the tournament without a whole lot of expectation. And I think opening up against Argentina, not getting hammered in that first game, was then like, okay, wait a minute, we can, we can kind of work our way into this tournament and then, you know, got the results they needed. In the end, sometimes it's not about flash and, and being great. It's about finding ways to get results. What was all he talking Venezuela, about? Venezuela, without the history, can't find a way to get the result. Well, if you, if you look at Canada, Canada's been in a couple World Cups. Canada won qualifying. Canada's won a Gold Cup. We keep waiting for, for Canada with some of the players they have to just become more consistent in that top tier of CONCACAF. Is this a step forward again that then we're going to see a consistency of Canada to be, you know, that side that is more composed, that, that isn't overawed by the occasion? I think this could go a long, long ways. But, you know, after they qualified in 86. It, it wasn't until the last World Cup that they qualified again. They won a gold cup and then they never, you know, showed again. So where's that consistency? Is this is this that step forward? Because they've like you said, they've got athletes yeah. and they can they can cause problems. Get a little more organized, get a little more composure to Ali's point in the final third. But you're also not going to be able to be as open against better teams. Correct. Ale, what kind of chances are you giving Canada against Argentina in the semifinal? And does the fact that they've already played once in this tournament maybe impact this game in any way? Maybe favor Canada? Actually, I think it's, it works the other way around, mm. Seb. I, I think now Argentina has seen Canada. And now Argentina has a different type of respect for Canada that perhaps they didn't have coming into the competition. And they know to Hercules' point, that 
Canada had some chances. And just a parenthesis on that. When Hercules says, if Canada puts those chances away, well, if we're going to play the if game, mm. if I had scored in the 2011 <laughs> Copa America, maybe we're Copa America champions. <laughs> all right? If we want to play that game, we'll play that game all you want. It's not about if. But he's you moved on. Score the chances, moved and Canada on. just simply don't do it. Easy. If the crossbar had been just a I've little thinner. I told you, a little I have thinner. turned the page. Positive vibes, Ali. I have turned Positive the vibes. page. Uh -huh. It's a... Well, that's right. Uh, okay, that was a parenthesis. So let, let me just go on about Argentina and Canada. So Argentina obviously knows that they had a difficult, torrid, horrendous time against Ecuador. And I imagine that there will be a much better performance from Argentina in the semifinals. And the fact that they have knowledge now of Canada and they have familiarity with Canada and a newfound respect, I would I would assume as well. I believe uh, Argentina will be ready to play, I and mean, the fact that they played before, I think, favors Argentina. They know very well some of the things now that Jesse Mars and Canada want to do, and the things that make them a dangerous team. I think Argentina will address that, and then the quality of Argentina should take over, and if it does take over, then I think Argentina runs away with this, as they should have in the first game as well. What do you think, Ali? Any shot for Canada against Argentina? I know you don't like the Canadian women's national team. Remember, this is shots men's fired. National shots team. fired. Okay, men's Very national against team. Very against. Yes, <laughs> that's a rivalry uh, that yeah we could talk about on another show. <laughs> but um, no, I don't think they will have a chance. I think if Argentina, you know, play the way that they uh, know that they can play, and also if Messi can show up yeah. and play the way that he needs to play for his team to be successful, then they, I don't think they have a chance. Especially how disorganized defensively that Canada was tonight, and that they also can't finish their chances that they create. Do you guys agree with what Ale says, that it's actually kind of a wake-up call for Argentina? They'll be even more primed for this, as opposed to maybe Canada taking some confidence from how well they did in that first game? Yeah, I agree with that, but I do feel Canada has a chance because I look at how Argentina performed with Messi, and if we're going to see that version of Messi, we're going to see that version of Argentina, absolutely you have an opportunity. How did Ecuador make it interesting in that game? You know, on the front foot, putting him under pressure, taking advantage of the man-up opportunity they had on both sides of the ball because Messi was walking because he was a shadow of himself because he couldn't find that gear. If that's the Messi that Argentina is going to put out against Canada, if that's the Argentina, that midfield that's gonna, they're going to put out against Canada, Canada has an opportunity, a puncher's chance, absolutely. But that's a big if. But, but why, to Ali's point, are they disorganized defensively? Because if they want to press, they got to go man for man in areas in midfield. And if Argentina are even half better than they were in midfield the other day and combine to break that and then get 2v2, 3v3 mm -hmm. at the back, it's going to be a long, long day. And if Messi can find those three, four moments a half that we talk about, and he had in the first half against Canna, but just, as we all said, in another day he scores three of those. Right. And uh, it's a long day for Canada, but the longer Canada can kind of stay in that game, frustrate Argentina, get, but they have to stay organized defensively. They can't be as cavalier as they were today. All right, so Canada are through to the semifinals at the Copa America. Let's get uh, one more thought here from Ale before we let him go because he is working late over there on the East Coast. Ale, what do you think the reaction will be back home in Venezuela to this result um, in this tournament, like a great group phase and then a, a good matchup in the quarters, um, but then missing out on the semifinal trip. Well, I think to, to evaluate the national team, you sort, of, you sort of have to evaluate what is going on currently in the country. And the, the national team, and people may not understand this and may not have this perspective, Lavino Tinto is, and this is no exaggeration, a vessel of hope for the Venezuelan people. And so when the national team is doing well, when the national team is winning games, as they did in the group stage, and they sort of give you this idea and this hope of dream big dreams and, and think big thoughts, uh, that takes away from the current realities of your day-to-day -day life in Venezuela. And so it's not just about winning and losing when it comes to playing for Lavino Tinto and winning with Lavino Tinto. It's a, it has an effect on society. It has an effect on the people, on the day-to-day -day activities of the Venezuelan people. And so uh, I, think, I think this is going to hurt. It really is going to hurt because 
Venezuela didn't lose to Argentina. Venezuela didn't lose to Brazil. Venezuela didn't lose to Uruguay. It's losing to Canada and losing to Canada in penalties. And I, I, obviously, people had built up a lot of hope after the group stage. And certainly when you see that you're going to play Canada, there's an expectation that comes with that. You saw it today in the stadium. And, and the stadium is packed of Venezuelan people. And those Venezuelan people are people that haven't been able to go back to Venezuela for years. And this is their connection to Venezuela. And singing the national anthem on Independence Day, you could see the emotion in the stadium. And so it's not just about winning and losing when it comes to playing for Lavino Tinto. There's much more that goes into it. So it won't be taken well. But I think people will find solace and hope in the fact that, you know, we would have loved to have advanced in Copa America. But the goal remains, and, and, and certainly it's, it's something that I've said time and time again, the goal remains making it to the World Cup in 2026. And I think this team has done more to elevate that possibility rather than take away from it. I think people will hang on to that and think of this team, again, as a vessel of hope for our society and for communities that really need it.